Now, this is the first opportunity this morning for a discussion across the room interleaved with short briefings uh, from uh, one or other of our three panelists. Um, the room is filling really well, and it's worth, it's worth just reflecting on the mix we've got in the room. The MR mentioned the combination of expertise and experience. We've got more than 20 chief execs in this room, joined by more than a dozen chairmen. The Law Centres Federation, Citizens Advice, Advice UK, Advice Services Alliance, they're all here. Foundations include the Legal Education Foundation, the Access to Justice Foundation, Virgin Money Foundation, Ethereum Access, Trust for London, Nesta. There are corporates in the room, Lexus, Virgin Money, Augusta, Harbour, Deloitte, and the Association of Litigation Funders. There are large firms and small, and amongst the large international firms, there's Linklaters, Clifford Chance, Freshfields, Sherman and Sterling, Reed Smith, Allen and Overy, and others. Joined by giants in the charity sector, Mencat, Shelter, and some of the niche, crucial areas of charitable endeavor, like Bridge Mental Health. And of course, there's the leadership across the profession. The Law Society, we've just heard its president, the Bar Council, Silex, Combar, the Chancery Bar Association, the Law Society for Northern Ireland, the Institute of Paralegals, the International Bar Association, and more. I'm only illustrating anybody that I haven't included in those lists, forgive me. I just wanted to give some color to the combination of expertise and experience that we have in the room. Well, we've, we've had a stimulating opening discussion, and here's the chance for contributions across the room. Those who've been here before, I think, know some of the ground rules for this session, and there's another one later this morning. When you come in with a contribution, please do give your name and organization. Please keep the contribution to a few sentences. By all means, come in for a second or third time later in the morning. Please build on a previous contribution or thought or theme where you can. And if you don't volunteer, please be ready to be volunteered. So, who would like to begin? I'm going to get the ball rolling by inviting somebody who um, attended the National Forum two or three years ago as a volunteer. He was moving around the room with the roving mics, and we've got four volunteers this time. Two or three years later, Peter Cruikshank. Mr. Justice Knowles, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Cruikshank. I'm a co-director of a small organization called Leeds Free Legal Representation. Uh, I'm at the very much junior end of in this room. I'm a pupil barrister in Leeds, and I moved to Leeds from London to train to be a barrister. Leeds is unique in that it does not have a law centre at all. Apart from one small cab outfit, there is nowhere that people can go to get and receive legal um, help. What I notice particularly is that you have a um, a gulf of litigants in person on one hand of people who need legal help and on the other common across the profession you have a lot of people who um, are trying to get in at the bar trying to get in and do legal practice and want to contribute but have no opportunity to use those skills and I'd just be grateful of um, uh, the panel's comments on um, how young organizations such as mine might um, make advances what the challenges you say might be um, and any thoughts on addressing those two issues? Yeah, thank you. Th thanks, Peter. Now, who, who'd like to follow on next? Thank you very much, Lizzie Irons from Support. Um, yes, if I could respond directly to that, one of the things that um, support through court centres do 
is work with the local legal community to get pro bono clinics in the court. And the great advantage of that is that you, we, we can see the clients, they're in court already, we can direct them immediate, immediately or by appointment to the pro bono provision on site. And that's the critical thing, because if we, if we say to them, there is a clinic at the university, or there is facility at the CAB, um, very often they might not actually go there straight away. So we can send them to pro bono advice, they can come straight back to our volunteers to carry on with the procedural work that we're doing. So in Leeds, we have a support through court centre in the um, civil and family court. So get in touch. Thank you for the opportunity. Lizzie, thank you very much. Now, one of the contributions from, uh, by way of short briefing from the panel here come, will come from His Honour Judge Barry Cotter, focusing on vulnerable people in the justice system. Perhaps I can ask Barry to speak for five minutes. Everyone in this room knows that if we are to provide adequate access to justice, we must ensure that everyone involved in litigation has a fair and equal opportunity to participate and, if necessary or they wish, to give their best evidence. The system must cater for those who are vulnerable. It is very difficult to define vulnerable. It is far better to look at it through the prism of being able to participate or to give best evidence. The system has to cater for those who by reason of mental or physical disability or impairment, problems in relation to social functioning, literacy, fear or distress, or a range of other reasons, which may include even the inability to access or, or use modern technology. It is to ensure that those people can fully participate in the system. Now, more than 20 years ago, the criminal justice system recognised the need to assist vulnerable witnesses. And in the 1999 Children and Young Persons Act, they set out a range of measures, the aim of which was to enable those who attended court to give evidence, to do so even if they were frightened or worried or intimidated. In 2014 and 15, the President of the Family Division, Sir James Mumby, recognised but at that stage, the family justice system was, to quote him, lagging woefully behind the criminal justice system. And he set up a working party to look at vulnerability within the family justice system. A wider appreciation began to grow uh, amongst the civil and family jurisdictions uh, of the need to consider how we approached those who, through reasons of vulnerability, had difficulties participating or in giving evidence. We recognised for the first time that, for example, questioning was very often poorly carried out. In 2005, the Advocates Gateway provided training tools for those who had to question people. The civil justice uh, uh, system is based upon the civil procedure rules. They set out in a lovely, huge tome, which many consider to be impenetrable. Within that tome, though, are a range of measures which can be used to assist those who are vulnerable and have difficulties with participation. The difficulty that many perceive, however, is that there is no overarching aim of ensuring participation. Our keystone, which is the overriding objective, is to deal with cases justly and at proportionate cost. But not enshrined within anywhere uh, within the rules is either vulnerability or, or the need to consider participation or how people can give best evidence. In April 2018, the independent inquiry into child abuse heard a lot of evidence uh, from people who, uh, having been uh, uh, the victims of sexual abuse wanted to bring civil claims. Uh, they did not paint a particularly happy or rosy picture of how the civil justice system enabled them to bring such claims. The result was that the 
uh, panel made an interim recommendation in April 2018 that the civil justice system, in effect, catch up and reflect the protections that are available in the criminal justice system. That was passed to the Ministry of Justice. The Ministry of Justice recognised that perhaps it needed to be wider in its focus than just the victims of sexual abuse and needed to cater for all those who wanted to access the civil justice system. They passed the matter on uh, to the Civil Justice Council. We set up a working party which has looked at best practice insofar as it exists in the criminal justice system and the family justice system. Uh, we consulted widely uh, and we produced in September 2019 a detailed consultation report. Uh, there was then a consultation process. The report itself set out seven recommendations for comment. They were that there should be a change to the overriding objective to enshrine the need to ensure effective participation for all and the ability to give best evidence. The amendment to directions questionnaires and court documents to try and catch and identify those who are vulnerable and may not in fact recognise that the court will assist them. Thirdly, and I think it's fair to say there was almost unanimous call for this, enhanced training for civil judges to recognise vulnerability. Fourthly, better guidance in relation to the use and indeed funding of intermediaries in certain cases. Fifth, that there be new court protocols because we recognise it's not just the judges, it's the interaction that any litigant has or party or witness with the court staff, the whole process, the building, the entire experience of being involved in the civil justice system. And we recognise that HMCTS has to reflect that in accessible protocols that are easily understandable. The sixth recommendation which merged into that was better staff training, and that was training of staff in the courts. The seventh recommendation was a discrete one in relation to criminal compensation orders. The responses uh, to the report have been very broadly supportive. They have, however, raised issues that we didn't consider. And I can say, uh, uh, as the chairman of the group, and without breaking too many confidences, that we've already recognised that we will need to amend what we have recommended and add to it. So today is an opportunity for anyone who wants to raise a point uh, uh, in relation to vulnerability and the way that the civil justice system interacts with those who may be vulnerable to have their say. We are very much still in the process of formulating the report. We had a meeting yesterday uh, and we would welcome any views. Thank you. Barry, thank you very much indeed. Can I ask... Nicola McIntosh, I, I'm a solicitor at McIntosh Law and I'm also co-chair of the Legal Aid Practitioners Group. Um, and thank you very much, Sir Robin, for, for asking me to say a few words on, on the issue of vulnerability. Um, I act for the official solicitor in, on behalf of mentally incapacitated clients in court of protection proceedings regarding their health and welfare. Um, these are complex legal disputes with complex family dynamics as well. And my clients have a range of disabilities and needs from learning disabilities to dementia, mental health needs, head injuries, and so forth. The kinds of issues um, which are placed before the Court of Protection involve disputes about capacity and best interests in relation to where somebody should live, care arrangements, and also deprivation of liberty in care homes and hospitals. The Court of Protection um, does have its own discrete set of rules which place P, the person at the heart of the proceedings, um, at the core of those proceedings. But it's a relatively new court in terms of health and welfare decision making as opposed to property and affairs. And we have, those of us working in the court and representing disabled clients have been on a very steep learning curve in terms of trying to adapt the court processes to ensure that P, the centre of the proceedings, is able to participate 
as well as members of their family who may well and are invariably also vulnerable. Guidance was issued by Mr Justice Charles, who was then the Vice President in the Court of Protection in 2016, um, in relation to practical steps which might be considered in terms of facilitating the participation of P. And I'm pleased to say that the Court of Protection Ad Hoc Rules Group, of which I'm a member, um, we are updating that guidance and we are considering whether we should introduce a specific practice direction, so not just informal guidance. Um, within my own practice, we also develop information packs for clients which are bespoke to their needs. I spend my time going to see clients in care homes, in hospitals, in, in secure units and so forth. Um, and those information packs and the way that we communicate with the clients um, are absolutely essential to ensuring that they have the information which they need to be able to understand the issues before the court, even if they lack litigation capacity. We need to turn the telescope around. The system needs to adapt to the people who need justice, and we need to move away from requiring those people to adapt themselves to the system. From the comments which have already been made, it seems as though there is a great commonality of experience and objectives across a range of tribunals and courts, and I, I think there's a perfect opportunity to try and bring everything together so that there is commonality. Nicola, thank you very much indeed. Hannah Hewish from MenCap is in the room, and I wondered if she might say a sentence or two, Hannah, if that's all right. Thank you very much for asking me to speak um, this morning. I'm Hannah Hewish and I work at MenCap. And um, what really chimed, ch chimed true with me was the issue that vulnerable people are not understood. And I think that's what we see with various different calls through to our helpline, 50,000 every month. Um, and the vast majority of them feel misunderstood, I think, by the system. So a large amount of what we do revolves around three things primarily. Um, first, we try and facilitate legal education so that the public, the vulnerable public, understand what their rights are in relation to the rule of law. We also work with 10 different care providers nationally who are really the, the boots on the ground for those people. That's nearing 40,000 members of staff will receive training through one form or, or another, whether it's from us or disseminated, and they can then help the people they support to access justice. And we also provide legal casework um, through a series of pro bono clinics to facilitate a move through um, to facilitate access to justice. So if there, if there is anybody who has any questions about that process, please do feel free to, to speak with me at the end. Hannah, thank you very much. I, there assured, assuredly will be people who want to follow up with you. But perhaps with that reference to public education, echoing Simon Davis's reference as well, I can bring in Juliet next uh, to speak uh, for four or five minutes on a next step with public legal education. Juliet. I'm slightly uncomfortable with that introduction because I am not an educational specialist at all. I'm the chair of the Employment Lawyers Association, so I'm a solicitor. And primarily, I spend my days resolving employment disputes. So in my 25 years, I probably had less than 10 cases that ended up in an employment tribunal. Um, and I'm mentioning this mostly because um, to give you a sort of feeling for why I'm talking about education and not about the tribunal system. It's certainly not a lack of interest in the tribunal system. The employment lawyers, you know, 6,000 of us, we care desperately that the tribunal system works well and our employment litigants in person scheme is probably the, the, the pride of our association. We think it's the most important pro bono activity that employment lawyers carry out. It's very important. Um, but moving back from that, it is very clear that if you do employment work day to day, that a lot of the people who end up in a dispute situation, not necessarily in a tribunal, but disagreeing, losing their jobs, falling out with their boss, whatever it is, a lot of those disputes 
arise in a fairly um, repeated pattern. Um, often when people lo lose their jobs for poor performance, that, that would be the employer's description, the individual would describe a breakdown in a relationship with their employer. That, that would be fairly typical. And some of these issues are not really means issues at all. I think um, the disputes that arise, the patterns are fairly similar, whether you're a boardroom director or whether you're a, a junior clerk in a, in a big organization. There are common themes. Um, taking us back to education, one of the concerns I have when we focus very heavily on um, dispute resolution at the end rather than at the beginning, and perhaps behaviours at work, um, you know, we've all seen the press attention on sexual harassment, quite rightly. Um, mostly it's focused on large organisations and people in, you know, the public light. It doesn't focus on what happens in primary schools, um, which is a very significant and, you know, far-reaching issue and obviously not the scope of this conference. But back in schools, there is an opportunity to talk to people about what comes next and not just about employment law, the legal rights, the bits we would love people to understand, you know, that, that you have a right to take maternity leave. That's a great first step to making sure you get it. If you don't know you've got a right, you can't ask for it. Um, and, and again, I would say that's across the piece. It's not just a, a means issue because, of course, the employers also have to understand that the rights exist. But I think beyond the technical detail, there is also an approach to problem solving um, that we haven't really addressed. It isn't just about what the forms look like at the end or having lots and lots of information on the internet because there are people who really cannot read that information on the internet and decide what to do with it. And again, I don't think that's just a means thing. I think there are very intelligent people who earn a lot of money who still can't read information on the internet and apply it to what's actually happening to them personally. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity to be here because, of course, you have far more experience than I do about pro bono work um, and about education. You know, I have school-aged children. That's probably about the extent of it. Um, but I do believe passionately that employment lawyers can do quite a lot to help. And we're, at the moment, we're working on a project to try and just connect employment lawyers with schools um, 6,000 of us across the country, so there's a great opportunity there. Um, and not only 6,000 employment lawyers, but 6,000 employment lawyers, many of whom are parents, and many of whom already have close connections with schools and the children in them and what the schools need, and who are generally people people um, and want to help. So thank you, Robin, for giving me the opportunity to talk today. It, mostly I appreciate it because it gives me an opportunity to talk to the rest of you. Please do collar me and give me all the tips you can because I'd be very appreciative. Well, Julia, we're, we're, we're very appreciative. If I may, just picking up on the number mentioned there, 6,000 lawyers. Just imagine, in the sort of scheme that Juliet has in mind, just imagine deploying an appreciable part of that number up and down the country in schools and moving even beyond schools. That's the sort of step change to scale that is possible next, and that's just in the area of public legal education. Harnessing the profession, in a way, um, and um, in uh, that uh, respect, I wondered if uh, there's anyone from one of the professional bodies that might might, might want to come in, come in, come in next with a comment. How about Vanessa from the Bar Standards Board? To be very clear, I speak from the point of view of the regulator. There may be people from the um, professional representative bodies here as well, um, uh, on whose behalf I, I, I may not speak. Um, I think that. Um, both the professional bodies and the regulators, many people will, in this room will know, actually have a statutory regulatory objective that requires them to promote citizens' understanding of both their rights and obligations. Um, and I don't mind um, being on record as saying that I think collectively, over the last years, since that statutory objective was introduced, we failed. We have not done well enough. 
Um, what I do now know, however, as I um, unfortunately approach retirement very soon, is that actually um, we've reached a tipping point of, um, uh, of, of the shame around that failure and are starting to do something about it. And both the oversight regulator, the Legal Services Board, and certainly the Bar Standards Board, and to an extent the other regulators, are actually now moving strategically um, to do much more. However, we recognise that we can only do it in partnership and those partnerships have to be with um, many of the bodies that are represented in this room today because we cannot access the audiences and the, um, the consumer and user um, uh, populations uh, that the people in the room um, uh, represent. So that's where we want to take that next and that's where we will be lobbying other regulators and the oversight regulator to take the whole of the professional community very soon. Um, one thing we absolutely have to do is to make sure that the rule books around the professions um, facilitate the kind of activities that Juliet has been talking about and don't in any way stand in the way of them. Um, and whilst I'm on my feet, if I could see Peter afterwards about pupil barristers, please catch me at the break because we've got some ideas on that one. Is that enough, Robin? That's not only enough, it's the spirit. Thank Good. you. <laughs> Thank you. Now we've got Simon Garrod here from Silex, the Director of Policy and Governance. So let's, let's take a view from Simon on this question of public legal education and the profession taking it to scale. How many, how many chartered legal execs now, Simon? So we're talking about 20,000 chartered legal executives. I like that number. Um, which is, yeah, a fairly decent number. I think, really, it's capitalising on a number of things that have already been said in the room. Um, we all have a role to play individually, I think, and certainly from a Silex point of view, we're very conscious that we need to maximise the scale of our own membership. Um, and in fact, we're, we're revamping our charitable arm at the moment um, into a new charitable foundation which will launch next year. And the reason we're doing that is that we want to broaden what we're doing in this space beyond what we've done historically and also to an extent which, um, where we've been limited by the objectives of our charitable trusts. But of course, we can't do that alone. And in common with some of the other representative bodies in the room, we're trying to coordinate um, our efforts together as well. Um, there's the shorter term game, there's the, there's the profile raising element of PLE, um, and in fact Justice Week next year, next February, we'll have a PLE theme that will begin to do that, and we hope to encourage other partners and there may be other people in the room here who would like to get involved with that. Um, and also, I think we need to work together in other coordinating groups, such as the Solicitor General's group that I know a number of organisations in the room are also involved in. So that's sort of the Silex perspective from, from now. Of course, in the light of the, again, the valuable panel chaired by Joshua, because that touched on the question of uh, assisting those who are going to find that digitalization presents a further challenge uh, alongside the challenges that are already present. I wondered if I could ask Adam from the panel, the head of digital social inclusion at Good Things Foundation to open that up in four or five minutes. Adam. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Good Things Foundation is working with HMCTS as part of the reform programme to pilot digital support for those who want to engage with digital services. This is face-to-face -face support um, delivered in communities. The aim of the pilot is to establish what works for users of HMCTS services and ideally to develop requirements for a future national service. The pilot is taking place in 25 locations across the country. They're a mixture of areas where need for assistance is likely to be higher, um, and also areas that have been selected by the advice community. Currently, there are nine citizens advice bureau taking part in the pilot, eight members of the advice sector, seven community organizations that offer a more generalist spread of support, and one PSU. And the pilot is working with six online services, civil money claims, divorce, SSCS, help with fees, probate, and single justice system. A bit about Good Things Foundation. We are a national charity, and we help people to build their digital confidence and skills so that they can have better lives. 
We do this by working with a national network of community organisations called the Online Centres Network. It's important that we work with and through the community sector um, because, uh, as I think has been hinted at but maybe not said directly so far this morning, low digital skills and confidence being digitally excluded correlates heavily and also reinforces uh, social exclusion in all of its forms. Uh, and community organisations, of course, and we believe very strongly, are expert in building the trusted relationships that are required to help people to engage with digital services, and crucially, to do this as part of their social mission, so that the process of helping them to engage with the digital world, use services and build their digital confidence is embedded in the process of helping them to achieve whatever positive outcome that community support service is trying to help them to achieve. Since 2010, uh, Good Things Foundation has reached and supported over 3 million people. Um, and as well as national digital skills programmes with the Department for Education, the NHS, and HMRC, we're also working with the Office for National Statistics to provide um, similar digital support for people participating in the 2021 census. So what have we learned so far from the pilot? Firstly, we've learned that the users engaging with the pilot are vulnerable again, a key theme for us today, um, and face multiple barriers. 80% of those who have engaged so far lack the digital skills and or confidence to engage with an online service, and indeed with the, frequently with the service more generally. 61% uh, of users engaging with the service have required assistance uh, to do the typing on their behalf because of either problems with uh, low literacy or with English language. And 31% of those who have engaged uh, lack access to a digital device. We found that the feedback on the support provided has been positive. Um, uh, using the data that we're collecting, we've seen an average score of 9.7 out of 10 in terms of user satisfaction, which is very high. And many of the users have also said that they would not have been able to access the service without the assistance of the digital support. We've learned that users need more than one type of support. This is a critical learning from the pilot so far. So as well as the support to uh, use and complete the digital service, uh, they also require emotional support, procedural support, and this reflects, of course, the wider range of barriers that they face. We've also uh, picked up some very strong learning points which have informed the design of the pilot. Um, firstly, that um, making advice in its broadest sense um, out of scope um, made it hard for organisations to deliver digital support and also uh, affected the user experience. Secondly, asking organisations to support all the services that are covered by the pilot also made it harder to deliver because centres frequently specialise in one or more. And also that there is an opportunity to improve both the signposting to digital support services and also to explore the delivery of digital support in court settings. So on the basis of all of this learning, we've been iterating the design of the uh, support that's being provided through the pilot, and we've been doing that working with HMCTS and the uh, user experience team there, um, and also with um, the litigants in person engagement group, which is chaired by Justice Knowles. We've also been bringing in more sites that are uh, in, in the advice sector community, working with LIPEG members, um, many of whom are here today. So what are we doing next with the pilot? We're going to be bringing more of these centres into the pilot, sites that have been selected by the advice sector community. We're going to be implementing a range of other changes to the design of the pilot that responds to the learnings that I've outlined. And we're going to crucially be continuing to use data and insights to evaluate what works in this pilot, both critically for HMCTS users, um, but also for the organisations that are taking part. The pilot is due to run until September 2020, and we are pleased to be working with HMCTS and the advice sector on this important area of reform. Well, many thanks to a Adam. And can I just highlight one of the things that Adam said towards the end of that, which is that the next year sees the engagement of a number of locations identified by the advice sector. I think this is the year where the advice sector is, is really, really there to offer its engagement with this development. And I'm very grateful to and proud that between them, Citizens Advice, Law Centres Network and Advice UK have collaborated to nominate the 
further team of frontline agencies in the advice sector that will work with Adam and HMCTS in that regard. We've not yet heard from someone who's been a litigant in person or who represents litigants in person from the position of being a member of the public rather than a lawyer or advice sector professional. Who'd like to come in from, 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 that, from that group? Yes, please. I'm Brad Meyer, co-founder of Help for Lips, now DIY Law. Uh, one of the subjects this morning has been vulnerability and identifying it. I have witnessed in court people who have been chairmen of board who, outside the court, walk well, talk well, present well. And the, as they approach the court steps, as they step into the court, everything starts to collapse so that by the time they're in the room, they're shaking. Having the capacity to recognize and to respond to that type of vulnerability is something that I would suggest be added into the agenda. Thank you. A point powerfully made. Sport for choice. <laughs> Great, thanks. I'm the other co-founder of what is now DIY Law. Uh, can, I'm a little bit more direct than Brad. We've been coming here nine years, is it now, Robin? Eight. I'm sorry, I exaggerate to make the point. <laughs> uh, we've been coming here eight years, and really, nothing much has changed. I admire Robin tremendously, but everything is about, we're trying this, we're trying that, we're trying this. Being not backward, I started a company in 1990 and had it nominated a share of the year in 1999. Now I did that by having something called JDI at the forefront of everything I did. Just do it. And basically we learned on the job. We didn't try it out here, it wasn't here, it wasn't there. It was done. And there's an awful lot you can do around litigation, in my humble opinion, as a long-term litigant in person, to do that. Now, Robin will tell you, for every year, and I don't know why he invites me back, actually, <laughs> um, we delivered a pamphlet like this. This year, we're doing the same thing, but it's something that's very close to my heart. I was evicted from my home uh, before I was a litigant in person, and basically, I know what it does to people. They go and top themselves. And I'm going from here to the FCA. And we produced a pamphlet this year about litigants in person and people topping themselves and how the banks have taken something like 1.7 trillion from us, us inhabitants of this country. And with respect, the law has allowed that to happen. Now I will shut up, Robin, without you telling me. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. you know the rules. Thanks, Thanks. so much. Now, but there's a, there's a serious challenge there, and I invite responses. The lady three in. It, it's not a direct uh, answer to that. Sure. The, uh, Caroline Shepherd, Traffic Penalty Tribunal. In fact, I wanted to go back to um, what Judith said earlier, and to some extent Simon and Barry, about how digital can actually enable people who are vulnerable and who find procedures difficult. We found having an online end-to-end uh, -end system for now for over five years, that actually our appellants use their phones all the time and the phone is the main instrument, the main, de main device now for digital communication. And this has enabled people to actually, they take screenshots and talking about Barry's best evidence, there is no better best evidence than a screenshot, which actually tells you the exact moment when something happened. They take screenshots of financial transactions that are going wrong online, where it's sort of saying, you know, system failed. And what's more, they appeal to us in, in text speak, and also you can tell that quite a lot of people uh, are doing their appeal by just dictating into their phone, because you can tell the dictation. So the digital format is hugely enabling to a whole sector of community who would not otherwise engage with all these processes that we're talking about today. Of course it's horses for courses, but it really does help. And uh, we found that actually the feedback from people who said they wouldn't otherwise engage because they can use something that's familiar to them 
and they can answer texts and uh, things like that, that actually this is a really good way to engage people who otherwise wouldn't be able to. Caroline, thank you very much. Who would like to come, come in next? Thank you. Lucy Scott Moncrief. I really just wanted to pick up um, on what a number of people have said about vulnerability, and particularly this gentleman here and Adam, um, that vulnerability is much wider than we think it is. Um, I'm a, a fee-paid judge, um, and so I have access to the um, Equal Treatment Bench Book, um, which is a fabulous document um, that goes into, with great sensitivity, um, how people might be disadvantaged because of their cultural beliefs, because of their race, because of their uh, gender, uh, their poverty, their ignorance, a whole range of different things. And, and it, it, it gives us information on how best we can try and um, reduce that disadvantage. And I would hope that everybody who is involved in, in um, developing uh, processes for litigants in person bears in mind all those sensitivities, all those vulnerabilities, and, and not just the very obvious ones, which of course also need to be included. And that's online, publicly available, that Equal Treatment Bench book, Lucy. Well, it's not very well publicised. Yeah. <laughs> I had the pleasure of um, speaking at an international conference on judicial training around the world, and the book that Lucy mentioned uh, was held up by all other jurisdictions as uh, an example that needed to be um, uh, taken advantage of uh, because of its excellence. I just wanted to uh, introduce, um, because uh, this um, uh, piece of information, we, um, the regional focus is absolutely critical and the master of the roles mentioned uh, his uh, pleasure and pride that under the leadership of Eliz Elizabeth Lang, uh, the LIP liaison judge network across the country has been reinvigorated. And we have in this room LIP liaison judges from West, Mid Mid West Midlands, Warwickshire, Worcester, Cheshire, Merseyside, Manchester, Crewe, Sheffield, Exeter, Southampton, Winchester, Bournemouth, Portsmouth, Cambridge, Ipswich, Bromley, Edmonton, Somerset, Bristol, Surrey, and Sussex. Uh, and I'm very, very pr proud and impressed to see that range on the judicial side alongside the range we've got in this room uh, in all other parts of the access to justice sector, if I can use that term to describe us all. We reach the point at which we end this part of the plenary. There's another part coming up. Uh, please be ready to volunteer more rather than my volunteering people in, if you don't mind. I'm extremely grateful to the three contributors of short briefings. You'll have seen that the workshops this afternoon aim to build further on those themes and on the themes that were opened up in the opening panel chaired by Joshua. I'm going to um, ask uh, the next panel chaired by Matthew Smurden to come to the table, but meantime, thanks to you and our panel here.